What motivates a serial killer? Is it their upbringing? Or is it a product of their environment? Or are some people just seemingly born evil? This is a question that has plagued criminal profilers for ages. It's nearly impossible to pin down because oftentimes it's an unfortunate combination of events that lead to someone feeling resentment and jealousy. It's a troubled person's misguided attempt at revenge for perceived wrongdoings that eventually lead to a young man in South Korea to become the raincoat killer. Yoo Young Chol grew up in South Korea to a wealthy religious household. Due to his own feelings of dejection, he would develop resentment for the rich. Prior to his killing spree, Yoo racked up 14 charges on his record since graduating high school, primarily robbery and rape. In 1992, he married and had one son with his partner. However, she left him while he was serving time in prison for a convicted rape. Yoo was a self-identified smart person and claimed to have an IQ of 140. He was also known to fake having physical conditions to gain sympathy from authorities. For example, when arrested on a rape charge in 2002, he faked having an epileptic fit. Upon release from his 2002 arrest in 2003, Yu reportedly purchased weapons and practiced for future crimes. Between September 2003 and July 2004, Yu killed 20 or more people, typically by bludgeoning them with a hammer and then stabbing them. His targets included the wealthy, often elderly, and women who worked in massage parlors as sex workers. When the police were first trying to solve these murders, the crimes looked like robberies turned homicides. But they soon noticed that no money or items had been taken from the residences. Yu himself claimed to have killed 26 people, and reported he had even eaten some of their internal organs to cleanse his spirit. However, authorities have only been able to officially find him guilty for 20 murders, and have been unable to prove or disprove his cannibalism claim. On September 24, 2003, Yu murdered an elderly couple who were once professors in Sinsadong, Seoul. Yu admitted to bludgeoning them to death with a hammer. At the time of the murders, this region of Seoul was one of the most wealthy. While the scene was being investigated for evidence, a faint shoe print was found. On October 9, 2003, Yu broke into another Seoul home and killed three family members of the Ko family using a hammer in Gugidong. Ko Jung Won came home to discover his dead family members and called the police. His mother was found closest to the front door in the hallway. His wife was found in the kitchen. His son was found at the top of the stairs. Due to no leads and the lack of evidence of the family fighting back, police considered Ko and the people around him as potential suspects. Gangnam police were spotted lurking around the scene due to the similarities of the murder in Sinsadong. Police were able to gather two faint footprints at the scene. On October 16, 2003, Yu dragged an elderly woman into her bathroom and violently attacked her in Sam Siang Dong, Seoul. During the crime scene investigation, an additional faint footprint was found on the air conditioning unit outside of her home. It matched the footprint gathered at the previous crime scene in Gugidong. Investigators determined that the same kinds of wounds and attacks were present at these first three attacks, and they were able to begin developing a pattern and a theory that this was a repeat offender. On November 18, 2003, Yu broke into a detached Seoul home in Hai Huadong and murdered Mr. Kim, the 87-year-old homeowner, and Beck, the 50-year-old housekeeper, via stabbing. After the attack, Yu set a fire to the home to try and destroy any evidence. This attack was different. Yu set a fire and police saw evidence of the family's safe being tampered with. Police assumed it was a robbery homicide that ended in arson. However, they were able to identify another footprint at this crime scene, and it matched the other two collected footprints. They used this evidence to also link these murders with the first three crime scenes. A one-year-old boy survived and was rescued. And for a while, similar murder reports ceased. That is, until the summer of 2004. Over the course of about four months, Yu separately called 11 different sex workers and masseuses from the red light districts to come to his new studio apartment in Western Seoul. This was under the guise of being a typical financial and sexual exchange. But once the women were ready to leave, Yu would then murder them. This was a major shift in his modus operandi. Rather than breaking into a victim's home, he was luring his victims away from the safety of the public. After killing them by attacking their heads with his hammer, 
you entirely dismembered these victims' bodies and then hung their decapitated heads from their tied-up hair on his toilet paper holder. You intentionally removed these victims' fingertips to help keep them from being identified. He eventually disposed of their limbs, stored in plastic bags, in the mountains around Seoul. He would take these bodies to their final locations in cabs, throwing kimchi in the bag with the bodies to cover the smell and have something to blame it on. You individually marked the locations where he had buried his victims, making sure he never accidentally dug up an old site. Yu's murders began happening in quicker and quicker succession as time went on. Prior to this case, police departments from different districts did not often spread the word about any unsolved cases. Unsolved cases led to poor reviews and less chance of a promotion through the promotion system used at the time. Despite this, after the second murders, police from the first crime scene showed up once rumors had spread that there were similarities between them. At the second crime scene in Gugidong, Seoul, Korea's first ever criminal profiler, Kwon Il Young, was brought to the initial crime scene investigation. At first, he tried to focus on reported crimes of the previous 30 years, trying to find a similar perpetrator or crime. He was particularly stumped by the weapon used, and the forensics team struggled to recreate the types of injuries in their labs. Later on, they discovered this was because Yu actually crafted his own unique weapon. Kwan assessed that the intense head injuries probably meant this was a crime fueled by someone with intense anger and resentment, rather than a typical robbery, especially since the money and valuables were left untouched. At the third crime scene, Kwan and the forensics team were able to determine that the footprints collected at the second and third crime scenes were a match, and the victim's wounds at all three crime scenes were similar and likely resulted from the same attacker. At this point, the Seoul Police Department wanted to deny the claim that there may be a serial killer for fear that the public may panic, but news outlets were already reporting it as fact. Since the fourth crime scene in Hai Huadong was so different, investigators didn't connect it to the first three initially. This was the first of use crimes where arson was used, and police found evidence that the attacker tried to break into the family's safe. However, a matching footprint and similar wounds were found. The forensics team analyzed the footprints and determined they were left by a buffalo shoe. They also were able to spot Yu on CCTV footage nearby the location of the fourth crime scene. It only captured Yu's back, but the family noted he was wearing a jacket that belonged to the victim's husband. There was debate within the police departments about whether or not to release the footage. In the end, the footage was released to the public, and for a while, the killing seemed to stop. Little did police know, Yu had moved on to targeting new victims with a new modus operandi. His decision to target sex workers in masseuse parlors, knowing that their disappearances were less likely to be reported or seriously investigated by police, threw the investigation off his tail for a while. Sex work had always been illegal in South Korea, but up until a few years before Yu began his attacks, police were known to allow brothels to function and even accept bribes from those that ran them. A new police chief changed this and cracked down on the red light district. This inadvertently created less communication between sex workers and police for fear of being arrested for their work. Finally, one parlor owner who had a number of his own sex workers go missing began to think something more sinister was happening beyond these women just running off. The final straw was when a man called the brothel asking for a woman to come to his home, but called from the phone number of one of the missing women. The parlor owner recognized the number and contacted police. After this call, police waited for him to call back and followed one of the workers to the location he asked her to come to, a park near Hongik University. However, this woman was spared and came back to the police. He apparently told her to go because she was too tall. This was evidently common practice for Yu, who was looking for victims that were short and thin making them easier to bury. Yu called the parlor back soon after and asked for a new woman to meet him in an alleyway. Police met him there and arrested him while he resisted, stopping him from committing another planned murder. At the time, they mostly didn't suspect him for all of the confirmed serial murders. All they knew was that he had some connection to the missing woman from the brothel. Initially, they had no evidence or crime to arrest him for because he wasn't caught in the act of soliciting sex. But Yu violently resisted arrest and tried to dispose of possible evidence. He tried to chew up and swallow a paper flyer for the same massage parlor. Once arrested, Yu quickly admitted to the murders committed at the four publicly reported crime scenes. One officer tried to belittle him, saying he didn't look capable of the murder, and Yu was quick to correct him. He asked for a piece of paper and began to jot down tally marks. He returned the paper and said, Sir, this is how many people I've killed. Yu then asked for the police to bring in his mother so he could formally confess to her as well. His mother and sister arrived at the station, and once he admitted, I've killed a lot of people, his mother actually fainted. 
You agreed to verify his confession to police by going to the crime scenes and explaining what had happened. They began with the Gugidong crime scene. When Yu was asked to identify which house the murders happened in, he went to the house behind where the bodies were found and began to give facts inconsistent with the crime scene. Many of the officers began to think he was not the actual killer and stopped taking him seriously. Police brought him back to the investigation room at the station and began questioning him when Yu appeared to start having a seizure. Little did they know, this was something Yu had faked in previous arrests. Thinking the event was real, police removed its restraints. Yu then escaped by simply getting up and walking out during the commotion of the officers coming in and out of the room. Police found him in the red light district and were able to forcibly arrest him a second time, 12 hours after he was first arrested. Due to his confession during the previous arrest, they had more reason to hold and question him. During the second interrogation attempt, Yu said he would have continued on killing had he not been caught. He refused to speak directly to the forensic investigator who came to verify his statements, Kim Hee Suk, because she was a woman. Instead, Kim listened from outside the room. Yu went on to draw maps and details of the home invasions, talking his way through his murders in a supposedly boastful manner. He also confessed to killing dozens of women in the name of God, and described the dismemberment and burial in horrifying detail. After his detailed confessions, Yu then directed the investigators to the burial site behind a temple in the mountains. They discovered the dismembered bodies of the 11 murdered sex workers. The provided details and the victims' bodies were used to verify Yu's confessions and detain him. The day after his final arrest, Yu was captured by news crews wearing a raincoat and a mask to block out his face, and he was dubbed the Raincoat Killer. At one point, Yu directly stated his hateful motives to a TV camera and confessed his guilt for the crimes committed, saying, I hope this teaches women a lesson that they shouldn't be sluts, and the rich should know what they have done. Initially, police had no physical evidence to use in convicting Yu. When they first investigated his apartment, it looked spotless. Using luminol, however, the perfectly clean bathroom lit up to reveal bloodstains all over. This was how forensics decided to take a better look at the bathroom ceiling, where they were able to find three different traces of blood. Police also found an altered sledgehammer outside of Yu's apartment building. The handle had been shortened, making its swing radius uniquely short. Forensics lifted blood residue and DNA from the hammer, even though it had been cleaned deeply. The shape of the hammer also fit the particular wounds that police had struggled to identify earlier. The DNA lifted from the hammer was used to identify Yu as the killer in the cold case of An Jae Son. An was a vendor who Yu stabbed to death, cut off his hands, and burned his body in his own truck. Police struggled to identify the body before or collect incriminating evidence because of how badly burned and damaged his corpse was. Before the DNA testing, Yu was never suspected in this case, and its modus operandi was much different from his other murders. On December 13th, 2004, Yu was sentenced to death for being found guilty of 20 counts of murder. The District Court of Seoul made the following statement on Yu's convictions. Murders of as many as 20 people are unprecedented in the nation and a very serious crime. The death penalty is inevitable for you in light of the enormous pains inflicted on the families concerned and the entire society. Yu confessed to having killed six additional people and was initially charged with one additional murder. There was no physical or identifying evidence to follow up on the additional murder charge. South Korea has had a moratorium on death penalties since 1998. Yu is still on death row today.